Okay. Well, good uh, afternoon almost to everybody here. Um, so I'm, I'm the thing, the person that stands between you and lunch, I know. We're going to make this as efficient as possible. Um, the bad news for you is I'm actually living in Spain where lunch is at 2 p.m. So there's plenty of time as far as I'm concerned before we actually get lunch. But I know you, you know, British people in the room, that's like almost too late for them. Um, anyway, so I'm, I'm here to talk to you about analytics and customer experience. And Nigel has done a, a wonderful introduction to what I want to tell you about today. And um, I'm really not here as the VP of product strategy, but more as somebody passionate by uh, customer experience and all the, the different problems that Nigel talked about. And I just want to deep dive more in how you can execute on what Nigel has told you uh, using analytics and what those analytics are and the different type of analytics. So it's not a product talk. It's really about uh, what, what you can take advantage of. So uh, if we look at what customer experience is, as, as Nigel said, this is really about any of you in this room interacting with our customers. And this really doesn't matter who your customer is. You can be a CT. Uh, I was talking to a customer the other day. Is, uh, uh, working at the CT in, in, in Madrid, and basically their customers are tourists, right? Uh, or you, you can be an airline, or you can be a retail. It doesn't really matter the industry in which you are. We all have customers, and Nigel said there are the people paying the bills, basically, right? And that can be internal as well. So the, the customer really experience is about all those interaction points that you have with those customers, whoever those customers are and what is the experience that the customer has interacting with you along the, you know, the, during the time of the relationship between you and, and those people as customers. So uh, why is this so important? I just uh, put like a different maybe angle to, to what Nigel said, which is this is really about being competitive uh, in the current industry. The usual, so I've been working for about 20 plus years, Right, the, the usual battleground in terms of being competitive was on features and functionality that you would give if you're a product, right? Uh, so now this is really almost like normalized. It's very hard to differentiate just on that and on the functionality that you're providing, on the product, basically, on the service that you're providing. Where you're going to differentiate is on this extra you know, mile that you take enhancing that customer experience. And this is really a, a great quote from, uh, from Jerry uh, Gregoire, who was used to work for Dell and, and PepsiCo. So what has changed uh, really, in, in the, what's the evolution of customers in the past years? Well, the first thing is, um, when I started to work, and, you know, and now I see everybody, everybody here is with the phones and tablets, and you know, there's some expectations that the relationship that you have with people is through those modern like, social engagement. Uh, customer service, for example, you cannot, as, a, you know, as any company, ignore doing customer service over social channels. Should it be Facebook or Twitter? You basically have to go where your customers are. That's, that's really the, the, the key uh, point. And uh, people really expect because they're to be treated individually as opposed to our group of people. Right? So it's all about personalizing the experience that people have with your product, whatever it is, uh, tailored to what they are, to who they are, to what their needs are at a certain point in time. So it's not about being the same for and, and giving the same experience absolutely to everybody. That, that is really the time of me. Right, it's all about centered of who I am and giving me the experience I want, not the generic experience you would give to everybody. So let me tell you a few stories to illustrate my point. Um, starting with traveling, um, I, I, I get to, so most of our team, uh, the R&D team, and I'm sure you know, is in Sri Lanka. So I get to travel quite often uh, to Sri Lanka, to Colombo. And well, you know, things happen when you travel. Uh, you can, you know, miss connections and a lot of stuff. But I'm going to tell you a, an interesting story that happened recently to me where I lost a luggage somewhere between San Francisco, I think, and, and Madrid. And for some reason, my luggage decided to go by itself to Thailand. I'm not sure exactly how that actually happened, but it changed. It, it's an incredible thing. I should have taken pictures of this, actually. The tag that was put on the, t on the luggage was actually changed to somebody else's name. How that happened, I have no idea, because I've put the thing myself. 
Um, and, and basically went to Thailand and came back, except my experience with that is I had no clue where my luggage was. Absolutely no clue, and not only me, the airline didn't have any clue either. Uh, and if you lose your luggage this way, after three days, you basically give up. They say, well, I'm sorry, it's like lost forever. You'll never see it again, <laughs> right? And a really experience I'm expecting is really not that. First of all, the, the, it's an airline I travel very often with. I'm a Gold customer there. I'm not going to say their names. I want to be offensive. But, um, <laughs> and the treatment that I get as a Gold customer is basically the same as somebody who has never traveled with the airline ever. Uh, they don't know where I go normally when I go to San Francisco and Sri Lanka very often. So all this experience is kind of negative in the sense that there's no special you know, handling on my specific case. They're going to come back to me. That's what we're all interested in, right? So that's traveling. The next one is, okay, who here has never had a negative experience with a call center? So people were going to watch that video. Nobody raised their hand in that room, right? We all have stories to tell about customer service. Uh, so the latest one happened to me again. Uh, wanted to travel from where? I'm not going to say the airline. It's another airline. Maybe it's a, there's a pattern here. Um, <laughs> but I'm trying to go from Madrid to somewhere. And then, you know, now they have all this experience. You have this machine answering to you, right? It says, where do you want to go? And very patiently, like talking like this to the phone, right? You say, I want to go to Madrid, right? And you just explain all of that, and they capture that information. And after 10 minutes talking to that phone, finally they say, OK, we're going to put you through with somebody who's going to basically take your credit card number, and you can buy the ticket. And you're like, OK. So I get finally a human on the line that tells me very nicely, hello, where do you want to go today? And I'm like, uh, well. <laughs> I kind of spent the last 15 minutes telling you where and when and how and <laughs> when I'm coming back. And she had no clue. Zero information, zero trace of everything I had said for 15 minutes. Incredible. But it happened. <laughs> and we can share our stories later. Um, shopping, retail, another interesting one. So Nigel was talking about this. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, from a business innovation point of view, I think that can happen in the retail world. And certainly, like trying clothes on without even being in the shop is one interesting one. Another one is, again, about, about context and, and, and users, which is when you walk in a store, whatever store, uh, you could have been in that store 50 times, or it could be the first time you enter in that store. The people working in that store have absolutely no clue. They don't know who you are. They don't know if you're a regular customer. They don't know what you usually buy. No information whatsoever, which basically, again, makes them treat you the same way they would treat Everybody. It doesn't matter you know, if you're a regular customer or not. So if you're in that shop for a long time, and you know, I'm, I'm the fast shopping time type person, so I know what I want, I just get in, I buy it, I go out. It's within five minutes I haven't found what I wanted, and nobody seems to care to actually help me. I'll just leave and go to the next place. Right, so that, that's the thing, the experience here is like, there's not really anybody caring about trying to help me, and I think like, I'm lost in, or turning around, you know, that happens to you, right? You run around in the shop trying to find what you're looking for, and you don't, but nobody really comes, at least in my country, I don't know if in UK, but where I live, they don't seem to really care and come and help, right? So what does all those uh, stories really have in common, right? The first thing is, basically, Know your customer. So you must have information, data about a customer. That, that data can come from multiple places, right? Um, and why you need that to have the historic data, historical data, information of what is this interaction that you've had with those customers, what is the history of interactions that you've had, right? But that's not enough. That's just one part. The second part of it is really the context, which is what is happening right there, right now. Where is that person in that airport, in that shop, in that, you know, on the phone? So you can mix and match you know, that historical information and that context information and use that in real time. That's the key thing we're going to talk about to actually take a decision, right? That's really um, important. Um, and, and you need to be able to, to react to a certain set of patterns that are happening. So a pattern is like 
Uh, this has happened like I'm on one side of the shop, and then five minutes later, I'm still in the same side of the shop, and, and two minutes later, I'm still in the same side of the shop. This combination of events that have happened in, in the time, basically, this is what makes a pattern that I want to react to. Right? So this is really the base information that you need in the base to be able to take a decision and better answer uh, to those uh, scenarios. Now, what do we get that data from? Right? So I'm just like, uh-oh, she's going to talk about big data again. Um, so we had all those discussions in, in the team for some while. You know, I'm sure you have that as well. In the microservices world, it's all about, you know, what is the size, what is the right size of a microservice? What does micro mean? The same thing for big data. How big is big, right? So I'm going to claim all of you here, it doesn't matter where you are, what you do, the industry you're in, you have tons of data. It can be in deep down into log files. It could be simply the customer data that you keep in your ERP, in your CRM. It could be devices that send you information that you need to take advantage of. It can be social networks. It can be looking into mail. Um, an example of that, I don't know if you've seen that if you use Google. Uh, it's actually a bit scary, I think. Um, when you um, receive a mail that has a, a meeting with a place and date, this thing magically appears on your calendar. It's like Google decides to take that information and creates a meeting for you in your calendar. And actually, if there's a place, if you open Google Maps, it will also show you. So that same trip I was trying to reserve, I, I really realized that when we were looking for a hotel in the place, and then there's this pin in Google Maps, and it tells me, you have a reservation in that place that night. I'm like, really? I mean, how do you know that? Right? So, it's, and the reservation has been made a completely different system, too. I'm going to advertise them, but it's it, somehow that data made it, <laughs> and, and there were correlation between all the different events, and they made up that, you know, from that day to that date, I'm going to go to that trip, and this is the hotel I'm going to stay in, and this is the car I'm going to rent, and they knew all of that, right? So you have all that information. Uh, it can be through APIs, through open APIs. There's lots of data you can really tap into, and I'm, there's actually a very low-hanging fruits that you can... Uh, take advantage of. Maybe there's some very obvious data that you have and you're actually not using. So how do we actually use that data? So if you look at the market today in terms of what's called like a higher level business intelligence, right? The, the first uh, part of it is what we call batch analytics, so analyzing data at rest. What that means is like I'm collecting all that data wherever it comes from, I put this into a big database, most likely a scalable and, and, and no SQL high-end high database. And then every X, you know, 10 minutes, one hour, I'm going to analyze that data, and some intelligence will come out of it, some information will come out of it in, in you know, some dashboards, some reports that I can use to actually see you know, the behavior of my customers, like you know, the typical thing, how many times some company, uh, somebody has come in my retail shop last week. What are the peak times? This kind of information, right? This is not something you want to see in real time. It's very interesting information. But that's not something you want to update every microsecond or every second, right? So this is like putting the data at rest and, and basically analyze it at will. But the sec and that's what most people are actually doing today, right, um, in, in enterprises. The, sec the two other parts of this are streaming analytics and predictive that we touched about a bit. So streaming is really what I was mentioning before, which is data comes in, basically, and you have right there, right now, to analyze that data as it gets inside your systems. And, and we'll, we'll talk about why this is important to do in real time. Right, so this is about detecting those patterns of calls, of events, between um, that will basically have a meaning uh, that you want to act upon. Right? I get some, some examples. And then the, the, the second part is predictive, which is basically using past information to predict what can happen in, in the future. So let's, let's talk about real-time analytics. So we took, uh, we recently did a demo um, using, I have a transport for London people in the room. Uh, so we use your data, <laughs> basically, of all the information that you guys are publishing 
Um, so there's an open API that Transport for London is giving you if you want to tap into that. It's very interesting into like the flow of buses, of bikes. It's integrated with uh, the different like systems within London in terms of moving around London. And we took that data basically to show you in real time whether it is better for you to uh, wait for a bus and how long it's going to take for that bus to come, basically. Is, it, is a bus stuck at a specific place? So analyzing all that information, right? So all of this is perishable data. What that means is if, if I'm looking tomorrow at the buses of today to take a decision, it's kind of, well, too late, right? <laughs> what you want is to get all that information, analyze it in real time. So we're talking about scales of hundred thousands of events per second. That's really a key thing about this kind of engines, of streaming engines, right? Is they need to be able to absorb all that information in real time to be able to react in real time. So what real time means really here, it really depends on your industry, right? But it's usually a few seconds or milliseconds. If it's on the trading floor, it's less than that, right? If it's in the case that interest is here of, of the buses, it's probably enough to have the information in seconds about uh, what's going on. So there's two main features that you need to do anything interesting in a streaming engine. The first thing is to be able to relate those events in time. So like within that time window, that and that have happened. And if within that time window, those things have happened, then you know, that means something. So, for example, like we're using this in our API management. Uh, Sanjeev was saying this morning, uh, we've put analytics in our API management offering. One of the things we're detecting, for example, is if there is like a very um, certainly a spike of the number of calls to an API within a very short time frame, that could be somebody trying to do a, an attack basically on the system. And maybe it's, a, maybe, you know, it's something you want to detect and alarm somebody about. Maybe it's not, it's a false positive in the sense that it's normal because somebody has been launching some you know, performance uh, test or something, and that's OK. But otherwise, you will have to detect this and know that at that time window, this is what happened. So that's one thing. Temporal windows are very important. And the other one is logical relationships between those events. So which are like, you know, this followed by that one, followed by that one, you know, that has a signification. If those three events happen in any order, it doesn't matter. But when they happen in a certain order, then it does matter, right? There's a pattern here that I want to detect. Uh, it's also interesting you can detect something that has not happened. That's even more important for some uh, scenarios, right? It's like, sh this should have happened. That even should have arrived, but it has not. And that is not normal, right? That is a problem. Well, that's something I want to know about. So the, the other part about the uh, streaming engine, really, which is really important, is that you could say, well, I can implement this myself. I can create some kind of a state machine and, and start saying, OK, if this is here, then this, then this happens, and this happens. But this is extremely hard to write in code, right? Uh, the advantage of using a streaming engine is that all that functionality is actually inside. What you're going to use is a high-level query type language to actually create those queries uh, without knowing how it works behind the scenes, basically. So trying to write a temporal or logical window of time yourself is actually extremely complicated. So that, that's, um, that's an important part. And the, the thing also is you want to combine real time together with historical data to take decisions. We'll take a, a look at an example in a second. So, um, the big, really, thing about events right now, everybody talks about IoT. Uh, really, the business scenarios behind IoT are extremely interesting. So I'll give you two. Uh, the first one actually has been uh, developed by a, a partner of ours who is in uh, this room now in Holland. Um, so that's, I think that's an interesting uh, scenario where uh, they have deployed iBeacons, you know, those little iBeacons thing. Uh, all across, uh, across the, the city of Amsterdam. So what you can do as a tourist, basically, as one of the use cases, is walk in the city with your phone. So you have a phone, uh, an app you have to install on your phone. And as you stop, basically, in front of a museum or something of specific interest, then all the information about that specific 
you know, touristic information about the history and everything, maybe some videos and information to watch, will come straight into your phone. So you, you can just basically visit the city by yourself um, in, in a very easy way. So here what you combine is the context of like me being a tourist, and this is my position, that's what the context IoT gives me, together with going and, and fetching information related to that position and presenting it to user. The, the other one is another retail example on top of the, the, the one that Nigel uh, gave. So this has actually been done by one of our partners in Spain uh, in a pretty traditional retail shop where, again, they've put eye beacons all across the, all across the shop uh, so that they can fix my problem uh, that I mentioned before, <laughs> which is I get in, uh, basically, again, I have an app on my phone. They know I'm in the shop, so somebody's going to be alerted. Uh, and if you are uh, a valued uh, customer of that shop, they will know who you are, they'll have your uh, details and, and how much money you've been spending with them, like all the historical information about how much they, you know, uh, money you've been spending with them. And they will know, you know, as I, I tell, I usually present this to a lot of men, so uh, there's plenty of men in this room too. I really miss women in that story. Anyway, so uh, imagine you're lost in, in the socks Thing. You guys want a, you know, some black socks to put on for your next uh, trip. And you're not running around in the, in the socks thing. Right? So somebody will come and actually help you and say, Sir, you know, not only am I going to help you and find the right socks for you, but because you're here today and you're a valued customer, I'm going to give you 20% on those socks. Right? So that's, that's basically the, the type of uh, scenarios that they're working on. Um, and also they can know this may even more creepy. <laughs> They can know when you pass in front of the store. So you walk by the store, but you're not inside yet. Right? And right there, right now, they're going to offer you a rebate, some money off whatever you buy inside the shop to let you in. Because it's very well known in retail. You know, once you get inside, you always buy more than what you had planned to buy once you're inside. Right? It's always the same thing when we go shopping. Say, well, we'll just go in and we'll have a bottle of milk and something. Right? And you go out with like three bags. Right? <laughs> so the important thing for uh, retail is basically to get you in the shop. So if you pass by, they'll just give you the same stuff. Um, now, what about predictive analysis? So this is about real time. It's about using information and taking real time decisions, marketing decisions, retail decisions in this case. Um, so predictive is about learning from the past. It's about using information on the behavior, something has happened and try to predict, based on that information and the situation, what will happen next, okay? Thus, this is all about, you know, taking information, applying very smart mathematical models to it. Uh, it usually takes somebody that knows very well the domain to actually do that, that to understand, that actually understands the data to actually do this. Uh, what you can do with that is basically three things at a very high level. You can recommend something. You know when you go somewhere and they tell you, because you have bought this and that, we think it's going to be interested in this. Or be, people who have bought the same thing as you have already also bought something else. Th this kind of recommendations, right? Um, also classifying users or uh, in, in some, you know, everybody was basically, again, has been doing this kind, of, has this kind of behavior. Usually, this is the next behavior they're going to have. Right, so this is all about predictive. Um, it, it takes really a data scientist to actually execute most likely those models. Somebody actually knows about this, about the product. Uh, we have a, a machine learning product. I can like walk through the product and, and basically create a mathematical model as long as somebody tells me which mathematical <laughs> options and, and algorithm I have to choose to apply on that model. But I would be unable to know, I need my, my good friends here from the analytics team to tell me uh, you know, which basically model to pick up, or which algorithm to actually pick up, sorry, not the model, the algorithm. So you're going to need a, uh, most likely a data scientist to do that. So we've done this recently. Uh, if you, you send this, uh, anybody here is, is an American football fan? Oh, that's a loss. Oh, I'm sorry. OK, so imagine those are like Premier League names. That's OK. It doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> the key thing here is about us using a lot of data um, when there was the Super Bowl game to predict basically who was going to win the Super Bowl. That's a big thing in the US. That's a huge thing, right? 
So you can see on the right side, what matters here is like the checks which are green or not green. On the right side, pretty much on that league, we got it all right. Like based on all the information we got, uh, we have a super fan of Super Bowl in the US who helped us with plenty of information on what are the key things that can really you know, make a difference when you predict this kind of stuff. We put all of that in the model. Pretty good, we got all it right, okay? On the left side, uh, those Bronco guys really, no, we're a problem. So <laughs> there's this team, basically, that was supposed to lose. And for some reason, they've been winning. A lot of things have been happening. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this is because this is all prediction models, right? This is not about a crystal ball that predicts the, you know? This is really about taking the past and trying to predict the future based on a lot of data. And that it, it's, so it's, you know, sometimes it's not going to just find the, the right probability, right? In this case, this is what we were doing it. But now, what would happen is next year, when we do this again, all this information, what we have learned, basically, from that experience, we're going to pour it back into the model. The, the, the key message I wanted to, to pass you here is this is an iterative process. So it's not like you take the data one day, you execute something, you get a model, you get some prediction out of it, and then you don't do this for X number of time. No, you have to take the data you have today, build a model, and as you go, you have to feed back the information to basically refine that model. You have to make it learn, basically, from the past and from what's happening in real time. Right? So it's really important when you do this to feed back into the loop and, and basically push that information through uh, to refine uh, the predictive model. So again, using the TFL information, uh, Transport for London, one of the things we've been looking at is combining uh, the um, instant, basically, real-time decision engine together with the predictive engine to tell the London travelers, well, if you're going from this station to that station, basically, right there, right now, based on history and based on maybe the weather is impacting, you know, a lot of the factors probably that can impact how long a bus is going to take from point A to point B. Well, if you live now, basically, from home, it's going to take you 15 minutes, right? But if you wait for five minutes, and, and then you take the next one, then it's going to be only 10. And actually, if you fancy the nice weather of London, uh, you can actually walk, and you'll go there faster, right? Or you can take a bike. So using all the information that we collected from, from their system, you can actually make recommendations um, on, on the, the, what to do here uh, in terms of the traveler. So that's another good customer experience for the travelers within London to actually lose less time as they go to public traffic. Um, <clears throat> and, and the other one, so um, Sanjeev alluded to this a bit uh, this morning, we've been working in this uh, uh, airline, but basically, again, uh, I'm traveling a lot, I just, you know, you know how they tell you you have to be there like three hours, four hours before, like no way, right? When you've been traveling a lot, you don't want to be there four hours before. <laughs> you just want to make that time at the airport as short as possible. But it's always a risk, right? You never know. Maybe it's going to take you five minutes to go through security, or maybe it's going to take you 40 minutes to go through security and then go to your gate, right? So um, th the idea here is really to analyze the information about the waiting queues at security and also um, telling you at check-in time, for example, OK, based on what happens normally, the time you're leaving, it should take you half an hour to go through security, so plan what time. Or, you know, you're OK. It's right now the time is like 20 minutes, but it's going to get better. So you, you, you can call him, probably call and come a bit later at the airport. So that's one thing. And then the other one is, um, I know we have all done that. You start running like crazy in the corridors to get to your gate. And you get at the door, and they go like, they close them on you because you're like two minutes late. But I understand them, too. And I, if they want the planes to be on time, then, then you just have to make sure people get there. And they will never know. They cannot know if you're actually running around like crazy to make it on time, um, or if you're just walking around in the shopping area and then you forgot when the boarding time was. Right? So in order for giving a better experience to people actually make the effort to run and probably <laughs> uh, have our good customers of the airline, same thing, there's like IBCons all over the place, so they can know how fast you're moving from one IBCon to the next. 
and if you're actually running <laughs> to get to the gate, and if you are, and most likely if you're a good customer, they'll just wait for you, right? But if say you, you're staying around in the shopping area and the duty free, then they'll just close the door, okay? So that's the kind of experience that they're gonna give you. Um, so one word about open source in all this. Uh, open source has always been a source of innovation, but in, the, in analytics is the source of innovation. Right? All the major projects that you know, that all the major companies, uh, you know, the Facebooks and the Twitters have been using for their analytics needs have actually been open sourced and all been maintained by the community. Is it Spark, is it Storm, is it Cassandra, is it Hadoop? All of this, also the building blocks of most of the commercial offerings that you're buying and also of our offerings. So if there is one place where open source is really uh, very innovative, it's all around this analytics group, right? So what do we do about this, right? A very high level, uh, and then you can go and, and see the different sessions from, from the team here if you want to get more details. But based on what I told you, there's a clear need, basically, not to look at all the analytics in isolation, so look at batch on one side, streaming on the other side, real time, and, and predictive on the other side. You really need those three as part of a single platform. So that's what we've been doing. We've been putting, basically, into a single platform. What does that mean? That means the events that, basically, you're publishing are the same. Doesn't matter if you're going to use it for doing dashboards and reports or if you're going to use them for taking real-time decisions. Um, it's, it's the pretty much very similar configuration language and, uh, across the different, across predictive, sorry, across real time and, and, uh, and batch analytics. Uh, it has sensors and connectors to many different systems. As I told you before, you have data everywhere in many different places. What that means is we have to be able to collect that information from all those different places uh, at the platform level. And then analytics don't work in isolation, right? So when you're detecting an event and you want to act upon it, this act thing, it can be sending a mail to somebody or sending a pager, but it can be also starting a business process, right? Or calling a business rule. So the integration basically outbound to your enterprise is also a very key part. And again, we have factorized that across the three, the, the different uh, uh, analytics types. So you can have a single platform which is basically deployed and capture this data wherever it comes from and take any type of action you actually want uh, on the outside. Um, so at the high level, again, you, you can, uh, we have presentations uh, during the, the next uh, day and a half on each of those, uh, pretty much, you can go and, and talk to the different team leads about how this actually works if you want to get some more details. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be around for the next two days if you have questions.